Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick, and it's time for this mo- this week's Friday Morning GM with co-host Voss Laricos. Voss, how are you doing? Doing well, doing well. A little lull in the sports action this week with the All-Star Game and all the soccer uh, tournaments over, but uh, looking forward to the second half of Orioles baseball and training camp right around the corner. Sure, yeah, both both exciting here in terms of what can happen, but I, I, I wasn't too excited about the Orioles' second half until the bottom of the ninth inning and the two Yankee misplays that that basically gave the Orioles an enormous game. Mm-hmm. Rarely, Absolutely. Uh, rarely see it. All right, well, we, Ravens had some recent roster moves that, that are among the top concerns. They have a lingering impact potentially, so we'll talk about them individually. Keaton Mitchell and TJ Tampa both sent to the PUP list. Now, let's remind people of what PUP is, physically unable to perform. Um, it, it extends into the regular season, and uh, if the player does not come off the PUP list, then he has to wait a, a certain number of weeks into the season. I forget if it's six or eight, six. but it's six. I think it's six. Okay. And then there is a th- – when he when he's activated from the PUP, he gets activated into this – limbo-esque status where he can practice for three weeks before coming off and joining the roster. When he does so, there is not an IR, DTR designation usage. Now, that's key because you only get 80 of those, and the Ravens are very crafty, and those are like gold to them. Mm-hmm. So they don't, want to, they don't want to spend those. But the two players who, who uh, went on, both potentially very significant performers for the Ravens either this year or in 2025, starting with Keaton Mitchell. Keaton Mitchell, to be expected, I uh, believe it was early September, somewhat gruesome knee injury. Um, I think we all expected he might be able to return to the team the second half of the season, but the first half was probably not in the cards. A um, little bit of a um, question mark is how that third running back spot will be filled. Uh, Rashina Lee, most likely, but that's not a guarantee. Um, so, you know, Godspeed to Keaton. Hopefully he's back and, and breaking those explosive plays off at some point this year coming. Right. So Henry... Hill, Ali, hopefully will be the will be the thing. The nice thing about having a, somebody on PUP and the Ravens have used this very effectively the last few years is that it gives you a built-in midseason replacement. Now, why is that important? Well, you've probably heard me say on this show before and the other film study podcast that um, the uh, replacement level declines as the season moves along with attrition on all teams, injuries piling up. The average cornerback you can get, for example, the average running back, the average. Uh, whatever position, usually offensive mm-hmm. line in particular, degrades and you have a you know you have a lower quality, a lower pool of talent available at the street level. So having a somebody returning from injury at midseason is actually quite valuable to a team. And they'll mm-hmm. often like defer return. So uh TJ Tampa, um I, I'm very excited, hopeful that Mitchell's return will show some sort of flash in 24 and then hopefully a, a back to a very key significant role in 25. Uh, after the great year he had. But TJ Tampa, also very important to the Ravens' 25 plans. They have Humphrey on an expensive deal, and they have Stevens, who they may allow to walk in free agency. Um, and if they were to do both of those, Wiggins has got to play well, and the Ravens have to, I think, have some indication that Tampa is ready to go. Sure. And I think we were both pretty high on Tampa through the draft process. Um, mixed reviews from OTAs. Uh, heard he had some good battles with Tez Walker downfield, but uh, I know you also saw some notes from uh, Jonas that was uh, you know a little slip step slow. So I was actually intrigued by the possibility of Tampa maybe being utilized as a safety at some point during his rookie campaign. However, when you start training camp or when Pup as a rookie cross training is pretty much out of the question. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that would make that exceedingly difficult at this point. It's something if they had their full time. It's so important for these rookie wide receivers, corners, and safeties in particular, wide receivers and defensive backs. Avoid freaking injuries to soft tissue that get you in this position. I think that's the case with Tampa. Is he suffering through some sort of a hamstring injury? I may be wrong about that. But uh, to put him on pup is a fairly significant move, but they still they can take him off before I believe the last uh, roster is set. If he starts the season on mm-hmm. pop, then it's then it's six weeks. So they, they have yeah. some time to make changes here. Yes, uh, pop. you know, they've utilized that to great effect. The Ravens are, as you mentioned, the master manipulators of roster uh, management. Yeah. 
just give them a game and they love to play it as far as that <laughs> roster goes. Um, the other big move is is one that potentially you know could be explosive, and that's Adisa Isaac, the third-round draft pick, going to NFI. Now, non-football injury, we'll tell you again what that means here, means the injury was sustained somewhere outside of training and before he got to the Ravens. And so that was true of Ajabo, who had a actually a combine injury, which does not uh, you know, that's that's outside of the, the the draft process. So that was an NFI designation and Voris who got injured also at the combine mm-hmm. in terms of that knee injury. So uh, even though it seems like these are football related, they're not Ravens related football activities um, with the job. Of course, they used the very um, white gloves treatment on NFI. Uh, yes, they did. And they, as you've mentioned many times, burn that burn that year. Uh, can't go backwards now. I was disappointed that Isaac landed on NFI. A um, little bit of a Dalen Hayes um, deja vu type of thing. Um, I do hope that he can make an impact this year. But uh, as again, if, when you're a rookie and you start camp uh, not being able to participate, the expectations for your rookie campaign go way down in my book. Yeah, even even if your rookie campaign is the next year. So uh, yeah, it's it's a it's certainly a bad situation. Um, I I think the Ravens are at a point both in the their um, construction of the roster, the amount of salary they have, they would aggressively use the NFI designation um, and and uh, potentially keep Isaac on it for the whole year. Now Isaac is supposed to be a hamstring injury. Um, it should you know unless it's a very bad one, it shouldn't take you know I, I, I shouldn't lose the entire season over it. But if he's going to lose a half a season, maybe they figure um, this is another potential replacement at a very deep position in terms of numbers, not quality. Yes. Where we might like a midseason replacement. Yes. So this may be an, uh, the avenue for Malik Ham to potentially make the roster. Um, actually, he was uh, put on pop, I believe. No, he was IRDTR last year. Yeah. But he was a player that also received some of these uh, this gamesmanship. So. It's, it's going to be uh, interesting to see how he proceeds, but I just hope his career path doesn't go on that Dalen Hayes arc um, with these injuries mounting or starting. I mean, to have a hamstring that was uh, injured before he was participating in OTAs, it's still lingering this long. That must be reasonably significant. No, that's it's it's bad. I mean, I would, I would, I would agree. I think that's it's bad. So hopefully he's, he comes back from that. If, uh, you know, I, 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 I we don't want him following specifically the path of David Ajabo. I think our our feelings and hopes for David Ajabo would be so much different right now if he hadn't played at all his rookie year. The Ravens still had four years with him. He turned in this first year and gotten hurt again, but he had that sack, one sack fumble. And then we'd be looking forward and saying, okay, well, he didn't play the run that well last year, but at least he maybe looks like he has some pass rush juice. Our, our expectations for him would be in a completely different level. Sure. And, this is this is how I kind of feel about Isaac. That it, if they don't get a complete season out of him, there's there's a point at which you just have to say it's NFI for the year. And by the way, they can still pay that guy some money. It doesn't count against the cap, is my understanding. Mm-hmm. McFarland is much better at 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 um, giving me the details of this, but it may be that whatever you pay him does count against the cap, but you you have some flexibility in terms of paying him. So either way. My, yes, my understanding is the NFI is advantageous to salary cap for the team, um, which is only fair because, you know, Terrell Suggs, as we remember, Torres Achilles playing basketball in a pickup game. The team shouldn't be on the hook for that money um, when we're trying to win championships. So, anyway, let's not go down that rabbit hole and uh, move on. Okay, so you now camp is starting, of course, on Sunday. We're recording this on, on Thursday. It'll be out on Friday. But camp starts on Sunday, and, and we wanted to talk about the biggest concerns uh, on the eve of training camp, effectively, and I know that you have some some macro concerns and some of the personnel concerns. But why don't you start us off? So personnel for me, I think it's a strong roster, better position than it was at this point last year when Eric DeCosta had to go out and get multiple pass rushers and multiple defensive backs in training camp and into the season. The one glaring need to me is the third safety. I believe it is a glaring need not only because the depth behind the starters is unproven and potentially not up to par for playing the deep the deep path, but also because Kyle Hamilton, as a defensive player of the year candidate, when he's playing nickel, not necessarily so when he's playing the back end. 
So that yeah. to me is the big, big concern as far as the roster. Absolutely. Completely agree. Hamilton is maximized by being close to the line of scrimmage. He is a lethal half field defender, takes away the strong side of the football field, the best horizontal defender in the NFL. Um, you know, the other thing about it, about not having a second really good too high safety, and maybe Hamilton could be that guy. He could provide this. It just would be limiting in terms of what he does, is that I think the cornerbacks under the system last year really benefited from starting in too high looks. Now, they gave away some things in run defense, which ended up being a fantastic trade. Yes. Um, you know, to, to do that. But but they got away with a really mediocre and unproven group of corners. I mean, Stevens ended up, you know, ascending and being a better player than we expected him to be. But Darby, he's got a long career already. And he's a, he's on the back. He's not on the back nine. He's on the back three of his mm-hmm. career right now. And and you know, he's a guy who who had a career year last year and, and uh, you know, a, a truly remarkable year within that defense. Uh, I thought Mollette played pretty well. Um, you know, not great, but 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 not terrible either. And 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 that probably is a little better than we could have expected given his age and and uh, and whatnot. But he but you know, Stone was a huge portion of this, having him on the back end, forcing the ball underneath effectively versus some of the um, less strong arm quarterback, and and most notably in the division, I'm talking about Joe Burrow because yes. he's the guy who who uh, uh, is is scared to death of two high looks. Yes. Uh, anecdotally, the best defensive seasons I've seen from the Ravens are when they have two deep safeties that are above average. You can go all the way back to the first championship and so and so forth. And there was a period there where they missed the playoffs multiple years in a row. And I think a lot of it was because they they didn't have that presence on the back end. They kept everything in front and they gave up plays at the end of games that cost them games. Um, I do not believe Ardarius Washington is that player. I know uh, – there's a lot of uh, buzz emanating from the the reporters that are employed by the Ravens uh, <laughs> that he is that he is uh, the safety, and they point to his you know first couple games of last year before he got injured, which I agree he played well as a nickel, not right. a back end safety. Yeah. <laughs> so that's so that's the important thing to note there. Um, yeah. Fortunately, there are some guys still out there, but that would be the one place I really do think Eric DaCosta needs to address. Yeah, there there are some guys. Daryl Worley from the team last year would be a guy I'd be happy. I've said it many times. Um, they're they're second set of guys that they're trying to figure out who among Bo Braid, uh, Jordan Tolls, and um, Sanusi Kane. Swilling and Swilling. Oh, and Swilling. Okay, I th- I think of Swilling as a corner. So he's playing safety now for them. I'll take this a look. OTAs. OTAs. He was. Yep. Okay. That that is really worth noting because mm-hmm. Swilling was highly praised for his practice squad play last year. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is something Jeremy Lucian was on the show and he talked about, about uh, Swilling winning a, uh, a practice squad player of the week or something. Uh, I hope I'm not getting anybody in trouble for that, but it's, it's a, uh, uh, you know, something the Ravens are, are, are giving out internally to, 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 to make their practice squad players know that they're, they're beloved. And, um, and and that's that, you know that's a that's a nice thing to do, but, it, sure. but I think the the thing about Washington, he, he's a decent enough tackler um, playing at the slot because a lot of his tackles are a short area quickness move forward downhill to take a ball carrier down. Usually before a running back makes his cut or or, or turns up field completely. Um, or before, while a wide receiver is in the act of catching the football, or is just turning up field as well, those things he's a he's a perfectly fine tackle. It's it's the guy on the back end I'm totally concerned about. It's the receiver catching the ball in stride. It's the running back who has a full head of steam and is looking for that. I mean, he's not looking to necessarily hit him, but he's looking to either hit him or slip him um, yeah. in in level two. And you you really have a, it's not a good situation for Arterius. And I, I, I respect Ryan Mink. I, I like his coverage. I like a lot of the stuff he does with the film during the year, but I, I don't see that as a, a, him as a realistic possibility at all at, at, uh, at split field. Yeah. Ryan's a great guy. Um, he has a type and they are, uh, low drafted or undrafted players at positions of need. Uh, James Proche, Pepe Williams, and Darius Washington seem to be his three favorite players from the last couple of years. And that's probably, uh, you know, what needs to happen from some, somebody in his position. But I do not want to see Darius Washington trying to tackle Jamar Chase or George Pickens in the open field as the last man 
uh, preventing them from scoring a touchdown. That is a recipe for big time uh, defensive pass defense regression, I believe. Yeah, Nick Chubb uh, and Joku, uh, the, the, whoever the, the Browns had as a backup this last year, I can't remember the name, but he but he had a pretty effective heavy running style against the Ravens. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want to see any of that. And it's, uh, the Steelers exactly. backs, the Steelers backs are oh, pretty strong too. Breakers. Yeah, good point. Did. Jalen Warren, yeah, for sure, and Najee, yep. All right, um, let me move on to, to another one of my concerns right now, and that is um, one that I don't see anybody else talking about. But my, my biggest concern, probably remaining, is that Henry gets old all of a sudden. Uh, he's in. He's a guy who's been in actually in decline in Tennessee for for the last three seasons. He had a forty six percent success rate in those years combined. Um, for, by comparison, the two thousand twenty three Ravens running backs had a fifty four percent success rate. And Gus Edwards is the NFL career record holder at 57.4%. That is the NFL all-time career record. I've only been keeping this information for 30 years now because they can't go back and get the get the did they get the down and distance paired up with the uh, play result. Apparently, isn't isn't there before that. But uh, um, Pro Football Reference has it. It uses the old Football Outsiders definition of success on an individual play, and. See, the Ravens have been amazingly successful in the Lamar Jackson era um, with this. So hopefully Henry's will take a step forward. I, I basically think if he's healthy the whole year, it's he's going to work out fine. The fear of Henry, even if Henry is a, a 4.3 yard per carry back, and he should be better than that in the Ravens offense, or even if the Ravens have an offensive line that play year that isn't good, and he's at 4.0, but the Ravens are, are, are getting some good play action off it, I can live with that. But you know the chance of him getting hurt is probably a little higher in this offense, um, not necessarily because of workload, but because of the offensive line uh, being new there. Uh, your thoughts? I think I think that's a very valid concern. Um, you know, also how is he going to mesh into the option game? You know, everybody says I, I could run any style, and everybody says that, but everybody says everything positive this time of year. You never know. I was going to make a, another concern about just sort of positional value. And I know that's sort of my, uh, my drum beat, constant drum beat. So I decided not to, but I think it is potential that this Ravens offense this run, rushing game has been so effective for so for, since Lamar Jackson was inserted from the very moment, essentially regardless of any, whoever was there next to him. And uh, I, I don't necessarily even want uh, a back that draws more attention and brings the safeties down into the box because that could end up suffocating some tight, the tight end, uh, the spacing for the tight ends in a way. So uh, I think that's a very valid concern, the Derrick Henry. Yep. I, I have the opposite feeling about what it does to the tight ends. I think you, you have a tight end in line, you have a tight end flex, you're going to have really good play action opportunities. If, if it doesn't force additional read steps from those linebackers that basically freezes them or has them moving forward towards a potential handoff or even you know figuring out how to cover Jackson on uh, coming out of the mesh point, then I think you, you, you've lost from it. If it doesn't do that, it's kind of like mm-hmm. if Zay Flowers doesn't peel a safety off you've lost some of his value if he's just covered one-on-one on a play. Uh, mm-hmm. But it, I, I do. I think Henry will give you that. You make a really good point, though, about the mesh. We don't know how that'll be. And Henry may not be a, you know, a loose cage guy like Mark Ingram was to mm-hmm. come and hold the football and allow it to be pulled very late, which is what Lamar likes to do. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just a, it could very well be a different running style. We've even seen on Zay Flowers on the on – the, Touchdown run he had against the uh, the Chargers this last year. He did a couple of things wrong on the play, but one of the things he did is he just yanked the ball completely out of Lamar's um, arms. It wasn't mm-hmm. a mesh play. It didn't become a mesh play at all. It became a rip play by Flowers. Right. And then fortunately, he, he you know he, he got to the edge and he got free and got a first down. Then he should have gone down, but he scored a touchdown. Then right. he gave the Chargers another chance. So um, <laughs> it was it was what it was. But mm-hmm. uh, uh, but I'm I, I'm a little concerned about Henry getting old. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, you know, I think the rushing game, whether it's even Henry misses a few games, I think they'll be fine. But uh, are you going to get your money's worth out of that contract with the salary cap situation that we've went over last week? Um, remains to be seen. You know, he's a 10th highest paid running back in the league at 30 years old. So uh, that's that's a notable contract. So if, if you were right now, if you could reverse this decision and have Clowney instead of Henry, and there was a few differences in, uh, there's a few dollars of difference in contract there. I think it was 20 million versus 16 for two years. 
Yes. So if you, if you could have Clowney instead, would you rather have him? A thousand percent. I said it. Yeah. I said it before the signing. I said it after the signing. I'll say it now. Uh, but uh, that's neither here nor there. This is the team that the Ravens have assembled. We're going to root for them. But I do think that Derrick Henry, a lot of he's getting a lot of press this week as far as he may be the most impactful uh, addition to any team, and he very may well be. But uh, I was hoping for you know players that are going to create space and make plays in space. And there's a chance that 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 kind of backfires in this situation. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that, and uh, and we'll see how that uh, that plays out. Lamar has not done as well as you would hope with eight man boxes because some of it is yeah. you, you do take away some run from him, but you you gotta you gotta find passing concepts mm-hmm. that beat it, and that if that isn't the focus of Monken's off season, I don't know what is wasting his time on. Because uh, it's yeah. really that's 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 got to be the focus there is how do you beat the absolute guarantee you're going to get is is heavier boxes against this team, and uh, and hopefully you'll figure it out. That one, that one, and I'll, I'll add on how, route combinations and spacing, passing out of twelve personnel. I think that's probably the other big uh, the big uh, thing that he's working on in the laboratory right now. But uh, if, you, if you're ready to move on to uh, my next one. Yep. This is a macro level concern, and I know it dovetails into multi- two of your uh, concerns, but I'll just say from a phase perspective, pass defense regression. So the Ravens had one of the very best, if not the best, pass defense in the league last year. I believe Clowney was a significant loss and will be will be seen as a significant loss during the season unless David Ojabo steps up. Um, and I think the other fact that is – Zach Gore, first-time play caller. I think it's wishful thinking to believe he can replicate the pressure, the disguised coverages, the deceptive pressures that Mike McDonald had. He was, you know, seen as a wizard last year to have a first-time play caller now coming in, and he's going to be able to do all the same thing in addition to the play sequencing, which I think is something that you really have to just learn learn. Or as you go, it's that's uh you know you have to have the experience to be able to do that. Um, Sequence, you with, mean like how on consecutive plays that right. what you expect to be pass plays that they might rotate coverages differently. Right. How do you set set them up? First down, second down, third down. Okay. You know how how are the how are you how are you manipulating the quarterback play after play after play? Um, it's that's something that I think really separates the the good coordinators from the great coordinators is the sequencing. And I think it's going to be tough for Zach Gore to replicate that with potentially lesser talent at both outside linebacker and at safety. Yeah. And it, it, it's relying very heavy on the talent at cornerback this year. They didn't have Humphrey. They hopefully will have Stevens for the same game. So they didn't have Humphrey for the whole season. They didn't have a healthy Humphrey for very much of the season at all, honestly. And mm-hmm. then they've got Nate Wiggins this year. So hopefully Nate Wiggins is a step up from Ronald Darby. He's He certainly is in terms of, expectations of eventual NFL talent. I'm just not, I'm not sure that in his rookie year, he's going to be as good as Darby was last year because Darby was fantastic. So we'll see. Um, we'll see how that works out. I, on the, on the, the coaching thing, it definitely is on my list of things. Um, all I'll say is Zach Gore was at least here, but then a lot of the other people who were probably instrumental in making sure a game plan is installed properly, like Weaver and Denard Wilson they're not here either. This mm-hmm. is not a, a a bad thing. It means the Ravens had tremendous success last year. Their coaches got poached like crazy. It's what happens. Harbaugh will hire new guys. Harbaugh will build a, a great new team again because he's done it so many times already and been poached so many times. It's just it's part of the game at this point. Um, and it's it's I think you know or being an internal hire, I think there is a higher chance of him being able to follow McDonald's basic plan than if he were from outside the organization, even if the talent's at a little bit different level, he's going to have to adjust for that. He's going to have to see what's working. You know, there's going to be that a second half adjustments is a, is a reasonable thing. McDonald was fantastic at it. Not even necessarily second half, just drive to drive adjustments mm-hmm. were, were terrific. Um, anyway, I, I, I don't disagree with it. I think Orr's, um how or uses the weak side linebacker position is something um, I hope he is. Um, not tied to last year's committed nickel or his own committed nickel play when he was the Ravens' weak side linebacker. Completely agree there. 
right. Yeah, back to the pass rush as well, because you know, they, obviously they go hand in hand. I think it's reasonable to project a slight regression from Justin Matabike, perhaps from Michael Pierce. That may be uh, offset by an improvement or a, an uptick in production from Travis Jones. But I do think the outside backers, um, Van Noy, as we touched on last week, would be huge. It's going to be hard pressed to replicate what he did last season, especially mm-hmm. with a bigger workload. And you, you really count on Ojabo in, in certain in, in a way. So um, yeah, it, it has to be one of Ajabo, Isaac, or. Uh, Tavius Robinson needs to step up into a bigger pass rushing role, or or maybe Malik Ham does. Honestly, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not so sure the percentage chance of that is that much lower than the others, other than he's going to be the last to get playing time out of the mm-hmm. group. Uh, it's uh, it, it might be might be one of these situations. Malik Ham kind of an interesting character because he's a he's a Sam linebacker, so the Ravens are highly incented um, to keep him around and see what he can do, uh, and and hopefully that uh, uh, that could work out. Um, they have lots of players by numbers, but of course they got Harrison in there. Who's a base package outside linebacker, Sam linebacker, um, doesn't really pat, rush the passer at all. Uh, in right. fact, most of the pass plays, he dropped a coverage last year. Uh, so it, it, he's, he's not providing you anything specific there. He's a run defender and, and, yeah. a, and a coverage guy on other plays. Um, yeah, they'll, they'll do a good job of keeping whoever they find rested enough to be an effective pass rusher. But this may honestly be another time where the Ravens are going to have to dip into the um, vet men, 31, 32-year-old pass rusher market sometime after the season begins. Uh, it, it, there's always a few guys out there. It's actually a position where the Ravens have proven they're very adept at finding a, a guy who's got something left in the tank. Completely. Completely agree there. I would almost put it as uh... – more likely than not that they don't. Because if yeah. you're losing Clowney and you're also losing Hamilton's ability to blitz from the nickel, you're losing a lot for your pass rush between those two. So they're not yeah. they're not giving that up. They're gonna find they're gonna find that solution because it's not an expensive one. I, I don't think the pass rush solution is not really expensive either. And that's mm-hmm. good because they're like very close to the bottom in terms of cap space, as we talked about last week in the right. entire NFL. So they, they only have vet men moves is about what they what they have available to them. Okay, you still got Chuck Smith. You still mm-hmm. have that and and some ability, hopefully, to get young pass rushers like Isaac, like Robinson, like maybe Travis Jones to take another step forward this year. Um, what would be your over-under on sacks for the Ravens this season? And they had 60 or 61 last year, one of the two. It was 60 and a half. No, it can't be. Uh, no. I guess <laughs> it could be. Sacks, right? Right? Yeah. yeah, that's true. For a team. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Long day. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I would put set it at uh, 52 and a half. Okay. So I, I would set it like I think 46 and a half now is what I'd say. Oh, it's, wow. They're gonna they're they're gonna they're gonna take a step back. And and I'm not that bothered by it. I I you know it was such an extraordinary year. And if you look at the past years where they had 60, they never had 50 the next year. Okay. Uh, like, Okay, they had 56 one year. They certainly didn't have 50 the next year. They had 60 in 2006, and they had a terrible 2007. I don't, I don't, I don't even remember how many sacks they had. But in, I'll tell you this: the Ravens played the Steelers in week seven or eight of that year, and the co-leader for sacks at some point in that game was a defensive back who had two. I'm trying to remember who it was because I don't think it was Corey Ivy, but I, I think I was, was going to say I was going to say Corey Ivy. That's the one might, that popped in my head. It 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 might it might actually been because he got a lot of playing time that year, mm-hmm. but it might have also been a, a dime back who played that year, and I, Jerome Sapp maybe or somebody like that. Anyway, I, I'll have to go back and look to to, mm-hmm. to confirm this, but it's it was one of I'm these situations. Still. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so we're we're through the pass rush. One more, one more, one more point on the pass rush. I am, I'm, I'm probably a few years ago there was a debate, um, pass rush versus coverage. I have stubbornly stuck with coverage, although most of the analytics have started to say that pass rush is uh, maybe slightly more impactful. But if you have better corners, presumably, um, and maybe Trenton Simpson or whoever's playing weak side is better in coverage than Queen, uh, maybe you give these guys a little bit more time to get home. But we don't necessarily have Geno Geno Stone on the back end getting uh, all those interceptions takeaways. Right, 
I, th- I think that's the that's the big key here, and they and they're going to have to find somebody else. They've got a there are a bunch of guys floating around the NFL that are big names that the Ravens really don't want. I know you kind of like Eddie Jackson. Mm-hmm. He's been around so and he was at one point he was good, but the last four years he's I think he's averaged ten point zero yards per target allowed. So he's out for me. Just Justin um, mm-hmm. uh, Simmons. Simmons, yeah, Justin Simmons has been at. 10 yards and nine yards the last two years. In fact, I think 10.15 or something this last year. Um, so th- that doesn't do it for me. So yeah, I'm, I'm having a hard time finding that safety, but there are a few guys who, um, uh, you know, you know, might be uh, a pretty good gamble and I, they wouldn't, Justin Sims is going to come probably still with a price tag above that man. Maybe not once the season begins, but he probably will until then. Uh, remember last year it was Van Noy who who money was the issue between the Ravens during the off season and then during the season they got him for that man plus a little bit of bonus I think right like two and a half million so and he, the rumor was he wanted ten million a year in camp and then he came all the way down he, apparently he wanted more than Clowney was the reason why I heard they took Clowney they wanted Van Noy more than Clowney but uh, anyway wait for players to drop into your price range that's another Ravens specialty there. Um, I, I've got one more, and it's the biggest concern for me entering camp, uh, and that's the offensive line. Uh, three new positions, left guard, right guard, right tackle. And I think we may have talked about this on the show, but if not, we'll put we'll give our percentages on this. So, so you got you got three players. You have Voris, I think, will be the left guard. You have Cleveland, who I believe will be the right guard. And you got a right tackle. You, you've got, I believe, Rosengarten will have the job at some point during the season, not necessarily to start. By October. Right. By October. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, yes. What's gone? What, what's we, I, I'll, I'll I'll save this for the end. You go ahead with your points first. Yes. Uh, for so I definitely agree with you on the offensive line changes. They're going to be inexperienced. They're going to be, it's going to be one of the most inexperienced Ravens offensive lines in recent memory. Yet essentially had two rookies with Voorhees and Rosengarten. And what does Cleveland have? About five or six starts to his name. Um, it can't be many. And most of them are mop-up duty or fill-in duty or week 17 where the, they're resting uh, Zeitler. Um, so they're going to be inexperienced. Uh, they, I think they have the potential to, uh, to grow into it. But, you know, linemen are probably one of the slowest to develop positions, I would say. Yep. And also, as a position group, are benefit the most from continuity. So yep. – uh, between the two, I think it's a valid concern about the offensive line. Yeah, both both great points, and and each of these players has their individual weaknesses. We could we could talk about as well. I mean, Cleveland is seven career starts, by the way, he's he's had, which is very disappointing. But I think part of the problem is they really expected Cleveland to be the right guard, and they didn't expect necessarily when they drafted him that Zeitler would play out his entire contract, and he did. Okay, so yeah. Zeitler was a very good player for that entire entire, and they tried him at other places. They tried, you know, him at left guard. He got a little playing time there. They tried him a little bit replacing Zeitler, which they thought, you know, probably correctly so was it was a big risk to have him around and and be the only guy there. But he just never really got hurt for very long. He did a little bit this last year, and then I think they tried him at right tackle a little bit too, at least in practice and maybe in a game as well, very briefly. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 the kind of thing that that the plan they had for Ben Cleveland accentuated by Ben Cleveland also showing up fat in his second camp um, really kind of slowed his development a lot. And I, I'm, I'm still optimistic. He's going to be a good player this year because his limited playing time. He was a good player last year. Yeah, I am as well. I've probably been more optimistic, more bullish on Ben Cleveland than most for the last several years. I think he is potential to be one of the best pass blocking right guards in the league. Um, Maybe not the mobility, but he has the anchor and he has the the length to, to just keep it keep the uh, the three techs at bay for the most part and the four eyes. So um, yeah, it, it's just the inexperience and the, and the lack of continuity, really. But you wanted to uh, we'll do some percentages. Well, I, I let me, before we do that, let's let's talk yeah. about the other players just a second. So Voris, um, I got my own set of concerns about him. I think he will learn to pull because everybody. Who's an average athlete has been able to do it with with uh, uh, Dallas Sanders' coaching, so I'm I'm very optimistic about that. I tell you, the thing I'm really not as optimistic about is that he plays at a pad level, given his height, where he can really anchor well. And it's very strange to say because he's an extremely strong player, so you don't associate a player of that extreme strength 
with having a problem anchoring, but it can be because he's he's got a, still a very tall, lean frame. Anybody gets to the body, obviously they're going. You know, his strength is not going to be as useful as it was. You know, with a stationary bench press and the ability right. to lift that. You know, well, the bench uh, press is a measure of upper body strength, not lower body strength. The yep. lower body strength is how you anchor. Yeah, you know, they should do a, they should do squats. How many times can you squat three seventy five at the combine or something? Four yeah, like, four fifty. <laughs> that makes a ton of sense. By the way, it makes a complete yeah. ton of sense. I I don't know why they wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't start doing that, but that's, I think that'll be Vori's big challenge. And, and he was a good pass blocker um, for the most part at, at USC. So hopefully that'll, that'll work out. And I hope he gets the, the run blocking components. I actually think he's going to have an easier time assimilating his natural gifts given Dallas Anderson's coaching. So I think that's going to come together fairly quickly, but the pass blocking, I'm always concerned. There's too so much going on there with processing and and how that helps him pick up stunts and pick up the the blitzes as necessary. And it's just there's more there's more talent and processing that goes on with that pass blocking that, that is is more difficult to figure out from what the kid does in college. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. And then we'll come back to the percentages in just a second because I want to talk about <clears throat> Rosengarten for a second. Sure. You know, a, a very much a finesse and mirror player. Again, another guy with a tall, lean frame that's not really typical of the Ravens' run blocking schemes. Now they had they had Simpson playing left guard last year, who's kind of similar to Voorhees, actually, in fact, being a taller, leaner frame. But um, they had Moses on the right side, who is not that at all. He's a, mm-hmm. he's just an enormous man, and and uh, uh, strength and size, and a little bit of a pear shaped build and whatnot that, that carries that body lower, carries that weight lower on his body. Um, Rosengarten's anchor is going to be sorely tested, I believe, at the NFL. And uh, uh, I still think the Ravens need to play him sooner. You said by October. I, I would, I'd really like to see that. I'd like to see him just start the season because they need to figure out if he can move to left tackle in 25. He's one of the options, and that's what they kind of bought themselves by reaching at pick 62 to get him in this draft. Yes, I would agree. Um, you, I think you can make a case that Rose Garden is one of the most important players on the roster. How, how his, his individual performance will impact the team as a whole in this upcoming season. But um, there's also, you know, Ronnie Stanley is not the most um, durable, obviously. Mm-hmm. And um, so there's questions pretty much everywhere except for center. Yeah, yeah I, I'm with you. And, and even at center – the additional responsibilities that are being heaped on Linderbaum with the, these two new guys, Voorhees and, and Cleveland playing next to him. And we presume again, that's going to be the way if it ends up being some, if it ends up being Jones taking one of those roles, you know, so be it. But it, any way you look at it among those three, there isn't anybody who's going to be central to making line calls, shifting, you know, getting this, the, what Jackson wants to do pre-snap lined up so that the, the tap on the fanny comes at exactly the right time, et cetera. Um, Somebody will be have that responsibility, um, but an awful lot of it is going to be on Linderbaum. And, you know, it's just it's like a golf swing. I'd say I've never been able to master driving in, in my life. So it's, it's like I, there's too many moving parts on my body mm-hmm. to do it to do it right. And, you and me uh, both. My short games, my short games, good, but I'm not good off the tee. <laughs> yeah. right. Well, I I suspect there's a there's a there's a greatly different level here, but also a greatly different amount of time spent on the on the green too. Uh, in any case, uh, hopeful about this group. But let's go back to the question about the percentages. So, what is the chance in each case of those three positions that we get a better year out of each of them? Uh, as we go across. And I've got my numbers down. You can actually see them, but I, I'd like to hear yours as well. Yeah. So I will say at left guard, especially considering all the Simpsons penalties the, and Vorhees pedigree, I would say uh, probably about 60, 60%. Okay. So I, I have it at 65. So if we, we're, we're close in terms of numbers here. And I think that's, I, I think that's reasonable. I think again, Voorhees is is learning. Hopefully, this is a, a he's. I hope he's one of the really quick assimilators uh, in terms of of getting into the Baltimore offense. Okay, so let's move over right guard. We have Cleveland replacing Zeitler, who made his first Pro Bowl last year. I thought Zeitler had a heck of a year. I really did, um, but I also think Cleveland has relatively high upside to be better as his first full season is starting. I would say. 35. Okay. I'm also at 35. And, and I think that's a, um, 
It's a number I can live with, and I completely agree with your point, by the way. Much more upside. Uh, Cleveland could be a, a completely move mountains guy. Uh, Zeitler, very good on the pivot, so we'll, we'll probably see um, some struggles, I would think, from Cleveland on that. But he certainly has the length and upper body strength to torque opposing players there. So you know, I'm still hopeful that that will work out. But 35 is a number I can live with. How about Rosengard on the right side replacing Moses, who was really the best of the Ravens tackles last year? Especially as a run blocker, I think it is, it'll, he'll be a um, – well, I don't know. Rosengarten probably has the movement skills to replicate some of what he did in his own scheme. But uh, as far as pass pro, um, I'll say 35 again. I'll say 35 okay. again. I'm a little more optimistic on Rosengarten after reading some of the uh, post-draft uh, clippings. Glad to hear that. Um, I'm saying 15 to 20. One of the things that I went back and looked at extensively after he was drafted was that national championship game. It was an ugly, ugly, ugly game against some very not quite NFL caliber pass rushers. So it's one of these things you expect Michigan to have a bunch of guys like that, but they don't. They didn't really. They had a bunch of guys who were drafted like in the seventh round and and uh, uh, UDFA's. I mean, they're, they're, it's not. There were guys that people wanted, but they're they're, they're still just not not guys that are necessarily going to star in the NFL level. So um, fifteen or twenty would be my number for for Rosengard. I think there's a chance, and you know, if he surprises us and has a big pass blocking year, and and when I say a big pass blocking year, by the way, for a rookie. If he's an average NFL pass blocker as a rookie at right tackle, that would be an enormous step. It would be the kind of thing that if if then upon closer examination of what's allowing him to succeed there, whether it's you know processing or whether it's really his mirror, um, I would be really excited about the prospect of him moving to left tackle, even if he could do that. But it's it is going to be a difficult, difficult row. It shall. Uh, fortunately for all these offensive linemen, they're blocking for Lamar Jackson, who probably does more to benefit his linemen than any other quarterback in the league. Yeah, good point. Really good point. All right. Uh, so that'll, that, that actually dovetails into my final concern, which is pass offense stagnation. And the offensive line is a major component of that. The other component is the pass catchers. I think um, losing Odo Beckham Jr. and going to Tez Walker is potentially a downgrade. Beckham did not live up to his contract, but he's still the best receiver or the second best receiver on the team by most metrics, both counting stats and analytical measurements. And I like Tez Walker a lot. I would have been happy with him in the third round, uh, but he's a rookie again. And maybe his skill set as a more of a vertical player rounds out the group better than Beckham did, but I also wouldn't be completely surprised if Nelson Aguilar takes a small step back from last year, he's been sort of an every other year kind of player throughout his career, bounced around quite a bit because of that. And just from a macro overall end of season perspective, chasing points through the air has been maybe the Achilles heel of the Ravens during the Lamar Jackson era. And I probably would have liked to see um, either whether it be the line or the pass catchers, uh, but maybe taking a small step back in both spots could be problematic. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. Um, I, so I, I don't disagree with you about Beckham. First of all, that that he was extremely valuable to the to the Ravens, even though his his counting stats were were nothing special, and uh, uh, his yards per target were excellent. He provided another outlet, and Lamar his biggest single step forward that he took in 2023 was distribution of the football. Mm-hmm. He got it to many more people. He had trust in many more people and he's got to, he's got to extend that to, to Rashad Bateman this year. It, it's, you know, Bateman needs to be in the inner circle, not, you know, standing outside looking at the circle from about 50 yards away. That's what he is. <laughs> he seems like he's been his first couple of years. He just doesn't trust him. And, and uh, uh, a lot of that is going to come down to timing. So if Lamar could could make an advantage, to take some steps forward in terms of on schedule play, in terms of really hitting Bateman to take advantage of his route running, which is precise and timing related, um, Bateman will be his most open when he first breaks free of that of that uh, corner. And uh, if you don't take advantage of that, then you reduce a lot of the value of Bateman out of that. Um, and of course, some would say you reduce the value of Jackson and his chance to scramble and extend plays and you know hit an open receiver deep late. Uh, but I think you, 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 you pretty much, I think the value of Bateman as a timing receiver is too valuable 
to waste there. Um, I, I do hope that they have some natural gain from taking Zay Flowers out of the short game this year that they'll take advantage of. So mm-hmm. you know, that was half a season of that bullshit last year. Hopefully mm-hmm. that's, you know, one play per game is plenty for yeah. Zay Flowers to run on a gadget basis. The, the rest of the plays, he should be running some route down the field, trying to get open. And he's deadly, um, uh, you know, in those uh, in space. So, Well said. Very well said. I think to your point about Bateman as the ISO X receiver, it's timing base for sure. And to Flowers, yes, definitely utilize the skill set to the fullest. Use Deontay Hardy on those gadget plays if you really need to call those gadget plays. Yeah. So just tell folks we have a concern series coming up. We're going to cover um, some of these and more um, uh, in, on individual shows. I, oftentimes, uh, sometimes these shows get put up in the wrong order, and Voss ends up discussing these things with me after everybody else has had a chance, and that doesn't really seem fair because you know this is a this is a show where uh, we're really talking at a macro level about the team and uh, what the general manager can do and whatnot, and, uh, and we really appreciate this. But uh, but in this case, we're in the right order, so, yes. so we'll be talking about some of those in the next couple of weeks. Uh, take a look for them along with camp reports, which. We'll start uh, uh, next week. So, uh, Vas, tell folks where they can talk football with you online. I am at, uh, well, I am the co-managing editor for Baltimore Beatdown, uh, Baltimore Beatdown blog, on Twitter, at Vasilis Beatdown, V-A-S-I-L-I-S Beatdown. And, excuse me, and obviously, Friday morning GM on a weekly basis now moving forward. Yep. Looking forward to that, Vas. Every one of these conversations is a lot of fun. So I, I, I really have enjoyed Agreed. doing this show with you. Uh, other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, hit me up. If you want to do a concern, get it there quickly because these are really intended to be as camp opens and not, uh, you know, as the season opens. But uh, let me know if you have some other analytics type thing or you want to talk about some specific scheme element or whatnot that you think is missing from the Ravens offense, whatever. That's fine, too. Again, DMs always open. I'll get back to you very quickly. Look for those camp reports next week. Voss, I'm sure Baltimore Beatdown is going to have lots of information from camp as well, correct? Absolutely. Kyle will, be up. Kyle will be there every day. All right. Outstanding. Uh, for Ken McCusick, this is, I'm sorry, for Los Ricos, this is Ken McCusick saying goodbye. We'll talk to you next week on Friday Morning GM.